going live. Like Bill O'Reilly. Do it live. All right, today is the 20th of February, 2024. And I'd like to welcome you all to the Anyone Can Farm Experience live chat Tuesday. A little cool in here, so I'm going to keep my my fleece on. Um, Tuesday. Ha! Huh. Excuse me. Tonight's show is titled Keeping Your Scorecard. And I know I've talked about this before, but this has come up in conversation and uh, all day long it's been, mm, 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 mm. we need to talk about this. I think we need to talk. I think we need to talk about this. If I was, this will be like a mentoring show. And um, I definitely want your input on this, Keith Sutton. Um, tonight's show, though, is going to be brought to you by the Anyone Can Farm Intern Program. This will be our very first year. We had a pilot year last year, pilot program. I had the world-famous Covey ba Covington Bali working with me last year and, and he kind of broke me into the whole notion of interns. I wasn't too sure about that. And uh, we did a lot of damage, a lot of damage to the evil realm out there that wants to keep a on sustainable, sustainable farming, actually. This is traditional farming, what we do. And um, it, it is my, uh, theory, my belief that with a lot of old systems that we're seeing fall down these days, we're seeing uh, the breakdown, the breakdown of, of a lot of systems. And there's a lot of chaos going on. And it's also happening in the farming world. And uh, what we have been witnessing over the last few years is uh, big problems in industrial agriculture. And you, you don't, You, what you what you have to do to see the breakdowns, I believe, uh, the major breakdowns, is look at the final fruit. The final fruit. And the final fruit is poor health of the people who are the end user of um, the products that industrial ag is putting out. You're seeing a lot of pollution. Uh, you're seeing a lot of... Uh, skyrocketing just debt just unbelievable debt on some of these farms and consolidation of of farms uh which is not good i don't think and so is is it getting better i'd say no it's not getting better i mean that we can see that it's not getting better and uh this type of farming is getting better i mean we've got bright people coming into this type of farming and they're doing well with it. And that that's part of what we want to talk about tonight. What I want to talk about tonight in keeping your scorecard, you know, if you've gotten into homesteading, how are you doing? How's it going? You know, is it just a hobby that you're going to lose money on and then in a certain amount of years go on to play golf or is it something that's going to last a long time? The man that built this house, it was his lifelong profession. It was his lifelong ministry. And then the next people that took this place over, which was one of his sons, one of his younger sons, did not farm it. He did not farm it. He went to work in town and just lived here for quite a few years. And then, you know, there was a lot more facility here than he needed, and, he, and it sold to another farm. And I, I happen to know that guy. <clears throat> and he had it for quite a long time, farmed it, and uh, then it sold again, right? Because they had no use for the house and the barns and all that. So now we have it and we've revitalized it. 
And I don't know the entire history before we got it, but I know when we got it, it was not being farmed other than some of the neighbors were cutting hay off of it and then storing cattle here. Uh, when I got here, there was other people's cattle here for quite a long time until I finally said, hey, so <laughs> what's going to go on here? And uh, they finally came and moved them off. I, they'd probably still be here if I didn't say anything. That's kind of the nature of some some of the guys that I was dealing with when I first got here. Like if, never mind, never mind. So uh, we've revitalized it and um, it's really only maybe the last six years or so when I've really found a niche and we're really starting to see the receipts and the receipts are good. The receipts are good. And in the last few years, I've been sharing what I'm doing. And then just recently, I've wanted to start to share the receipts. Why would anybody want to get into this? If it's just a hobby where you lose money, if it's truly hobby farming and you're not making a gain, why would anybody want to do that? And I, I'm just the type of person I got into it. And I'm a, some people would say I'm a little on the hard headed side. I don't know why they'd say that, but I stayed with it and there was enough interest in it on my part that I stayed with it and started to decipher some of the some of the codes, I guess, that are involved in it to where, oh, all of a sudden, this works. This works. Some of the processes that we came across early on, we stumbled into them. We just stumbled into them. And, you know, I had this mindset when I first started that I want to do this. I want to do this. And we'd stumble into something and it works, but that's not really what I wanted to do. And so it took a bunch of those uh, processes until I finally realized, oh, overall you want to farm. Is that correct? Yes, I do. I want to farm. I want to build up this little ecosystem that I can live in and I can get up every day and I work here, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to sharing those reasons at this point. You know, the environment I came out of before, even though it wasn't the intenseness that some of my other GI friends have, have been involved in, you know, with a lot of shooting and, uh, and things like that, you know, what war is about, it's still, there was an, a different type of intenseness that I learned to live with in the 20 years that I was in the military. And then when I would get out, there was this vacuum, this huge vacuum. And it's kind of like, well, nothing really means anything. You know, I mean, if you're late for something, that doesn't matter. You know, if you're supposed to be someplace, you don't show up. Yeah, yeah they didn't show up. And I would deal with that with my counterparts in the civilian world, and it was really difficult for me. Um, and there was other things too. I think uh, the environment that I was in, I, I, I probably established pathways in my mind of how things are to be done. And then when that's not how they do it here, it was disturbing. And I, I, I probably got a little intense and uh, it took a while but I am learning this, these pathways. And in, in some circles, when you deal with, with other veterans, they, they have names for it. And they will say, well, you need to get counseling. Well, this was my counseling. This, I am a self-help type person. And I found, I found solace in this farm. I found meaning. I found my work. You know, my work is very important. Um, there was parts of the military that were not good for me in in that they would say, this is how we do it, and this, this is how we do it. Yeah, but I'm kind of a creative guy. Well, we don't need creativity here. So just do it our way. And any 
uh, anytime I would display any creativity, it was swatted down and, you know, it's kind of rogue and uh, free thinking is not a, you know, and I, I get that, you know, if you're uh, training young people to do the things that we were doing, uh, there's a certain way to do it. And I look back on on what I was a part of, and it it really did work like clockwork. And when you think about all of the people that needed to be involved in what we were doing to make it work seamlessly, it was very good. So I'm not uh, ridiculing that at all, but that was how that needed to be done. This is different. This is different. Uh, this is the type of life that I wanted. I could not continue in the life that I was in. I, I did not want to do that. I mean, I, I always was holding back a little bit, you know, I, I would do my job and do it properly, but it was never what I wanted to do. It was never, I never got the feeling that I get with this, with this, uh, you take a step and then it leads to the next step and the next step. And there's all kinds of emotions. Uh, there's good emotions. There's, I guess, or, or emotions that feel good, and then there's emotions that don't feel good, but they help you to move into the air. I'm starting to sound like Kamala Harris here, but I hope you know what, I hope you can understand what I'm saying. There's all kinds of emotions. Uh, a, most of everything that happens, if I'm the, it falls on me because I'm the, the top guy in my role. Uh, I am the top guy. I am the spear catcher here. Um, and I like that. Um, it's challenging. I uh, am in my retirement job, I guess they call it. Um, but get this, you guys. This year, in May 2024, I will have been here 20 years. So I was in the military for 20 years. Now I'm out of the military for 20 years. Seems like a long time. I remember thinking when I first got in, wow, it's just going to be a really old guy by the time you get out in 20 years. I'll never stay 20 years, I would say. No way will I do that. And some of you may ask, why did you stay 20 years? Well, there was a chain of events that happened and um, things that were happening in the world. And you couldn't leave. You know, They wouldn't let you go because we had jobs to do and they had to be done. I'm not saying they were the greatest uh, plans. I wasn't the planner. I was just a tool in the toolbox. And... Uh, and then when I got a little older, I had people that were relying on me um, and they were a lot younger than me. And uh, so I, at one point, I made a decision, okay, I'm going to stay for one more. And that put me up way over halfway. And uh, by that time, I had family responsibilities and, uh, you know, still having babies. Fertility was up spirits were high and so it made sense to stay till the end to the 20 years and there's benefits that go with that you know you get a retirement you know isn't a lot but if you don't go 20 you don't get any of it um i i get medical care for the rest of my life which you know that's debatable i don't use it uh i i'm a big preventative maintenance guy so i don't use it um, I don't just go to the doctor if I feel good. You know, it's like I don't take my car in to get fixed if it's running good. Um, and uh, the last time I did have to go to a doctor, it was because I was thinking about taking a job. There was a job available at the Army base, which is north of me. And I really like aviation, and I, would, I thought I would like being around that environment. And so I applied for the job, and they wanted me to get a physical, so I did. And uh, that was the first time that I've been there. And that, and they actually uh, were somewhat accusatory that I was falsifying my medical records because there were no entries. So this was four years ago or so, and I've been out 20. So I hadn't been to the doctor except for a broken bone. And uh, yeah, that was it. That was it.
everything was working. So I just pressed on and I haven't been back since, you know, everything's working. So why, why go? Right. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of my story. Uh, I am in this and I am committed to this. The only reason that I would leave this probably is because at some point, um, my wife wants to have what she calls the grandma house. And that will probably be when there are no children in the home of my children. But who knows? Who knows what will happen? We don't know. Uh, we take it a day at a time. Uh, there's been discussion about that, you know, the grandma house operation, you know, maybe on a lake or something or uh, on a river, you know, with nothing more to do than mow the lawn. And uh, I, But I don't know. I like working. I like the things that I do. Uh, they're a challenge to me. And it keeps my mind going. I really enjoy what I'm doing. So I'm for for the for now. I'm here, right? Um, all that said, uh, tonight's show is sponsored by the Anyone Can Farm Intern Program. Uh, this is going to be starting Memorial Day. We're going to take four interns, and they are basically going to be trained. It's going to go Memorial Day to Labor Day. No exceptions. It's like a school. We're not going to charge them for being here. Although I kind of wonder if you went to the college, you don't get to just work there for free. But um, I think it's a way that we can pass on these skills. And it does a lot of damage, a lot of damage to the evil realm out there that wants to centralize all food production. And anytime I can do damage to that realm, I'm all in. I am all in. Um and this is the way to do it. You know, it's like the nonviolent way to uh, to thwart their efforts to have all food production uh, done by the experts and uh, run by science, you know, trusting the science. So I don't like that whole idea. I don't want to eat. If, if they had their way, we would all be eating bugs. You, you guys know that. And uh, I'm sure that you've had enough lessons over the last few years that when it's when they talk about science you got to take that with a grain of salt there is science there is good medical but there are those who have co-opted that because we have faith in that system but i think what anyone can farm is about is becoming is having faith in ourselves right in our own capacity to no thanks we'll take care of this you know so um, that's what the intern program is about. Um, the interns are not going to be here for a vacation. They're going to push really hard. Covey can attest to that. We pushed him. And uh, he, he found that he was capable of a whole lot more than he believed he was. And it was a process, you know. And uh, there was, you know, there was a few, few tears along the way. Or oh, I shouldn't say tears. A few T hard times along the way, but um, he prevailed. He was able to uh, to suck it up when need need be, and then bear down when he was asked to. And he was a very good troop. I he will be this coming summer. There will be three other new people coming, um, two females and one male, and then Covey. So there'll be four. But he will be the lead man. He will be the guy that they turn to. To like, what do we do today? And he will be the guy that I will tell, this is what I need done today. You dispatch these people appropriately. And I believe he can handle it. I mean, I have faith in him. I know he can handle it. I know he can. And then I'll always be there over him that if he doesn't do what I want, I will just turn the water off over there. Yep. And you really act up, son, and I will turn the electricity off. Okay. Another thing that I need to brief you on is... The Anyone Can Farm Baker's Green Acres Seed and Seedling Day. We've changed the date on this. We did Seed Exchange Day prior to this year. We did it in April, and we're adjusting it. And we're going to hosey. Uh, that's a word that my sisters used to use. We're going to hosey May 4th. That's going to be our day. So all of yous out there... You can just take that off your calendar because that's going to be an open farm day and you can bring 
your seeds that you've saved and exchange with friends, your seedlings. See, it's a little bit later in the, in the season. Um, and we're going to, this year, we're going to try accepting vendors. So the farm will be open. You can come and set up whatever you do that's farm related. And you can vend. You can sell. It's going to cost you to do that. And we figure that the money that we get from those vendors will pay for the porta potties and any of the sundries that we need to buy because we do serve lunch. Um, I might knock down a pig that we can barbecue, but it, I may will be better because in April we did have problems with the weather a couple of times and we wound up with everyone in the house. So now we have a little bit more facility, and if we need to, we'll just be using, um, you know, the butcher shop and the cafe. The cafe should be up and running really nicely by then, um, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll we'll make it nice. It's not a it's not a grand event here. It's nothing like Tribe Day, but it's still it's turned. It's turned some heads. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, my scorecard that I would use for the events that we do here. Um, I can't say completely. Um, when we do Homestead Hog Harvest, that is to some people an expensive class, but it is three days. So we have to dedicate that time. We have to dedicate animals to ho hog harvest, you know, to full-grown mangalitsas. So we have some expenses that we lay out. When it's all said and done, we do pretty well with that. You know, if we have 12 people that come, 12, 14 people, and we're charging, I think it's $7.50 a head, uh, all the meals are included, and they have to get their rooms downtown. So, you know, it does cost you. But that knowledge, if you amortize that out over a few years, it pays for it because you learn how to process an animal. You know, from stem to stern, we start with live animals and we end with sausages and bacons and the cuts. And we, you know, we cover everything from... Uh, the firearm that we use to to shoot the animal, to the knives that we use, and and then we make the entire pig that we process available at a really reduced rate because you know we can't really sell that, so we make that available to the students at a very reduced rate, and that pays for the animals. You know, not it doesn't do as well as if we had butchered them ourselves and sold them outright, but it. You know, it it fudges it over a little bit, but my scar my scorecard on that is not. It is not the dollars, that's part of it, but everything we're doing here. There is sort of a graph, I would say, of gains, right? And dollars is one of the, of the graphs, you know, of the. Uh, Oh, if it was, let's say it was a bar graph, it's one of the bars, but then there are other things that are not as tangible. Uh, for me, as the guy that kind of heads this up and is interested in doing damage to the realm, uh, when people contact me and say, you know, I processed my first pig last weekend. Yeah, I had neighbors over and everybody had a great time and like, I can tell that we've started something. We've started a spot fire that nobody's going to put out. Nobody can put that out. Once you ignite that fire in the human heart, no bureaucrat, weenie, uh, white coat, uh, hairnet, clipboard holding weenie can put that out. They cannot put that out because... Those weenies are employees, and their motivation is a paycheck. Are they in? Are they? Are they invested in that as a human being? I would say no. I've not met one. 
you know, I've heard what comes out of their mouth, but that little voice in my head is saying, yeah, right. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. I don't believe them, you know, and, and, but when I see, uh, some of the people that we've mentored and I see what they do on their own without our help there, you know, they do, they're doing it at their home. And then I hear them relate the stories of how it went with their families and how spouses, how it's brought them together into a common direction. And that's gold. That's gold. That makes the bar graph uh, with the dollars on it looks like, you know, that's, that's, that's hay, wood and stubble compared to making legitimate changes or, or fostering legitimate changes in people's lives who want that change. You know, we're not forcing anybody to come to these classes by any means, not by any means. Uh, so that's the, that's my scorecard when we do these things. So uh, seed saving day or seedling day is one of those things. You you can see it in people's faces. People are making sacrifices to come and be here and be with others who are enthused about this way of life. Okay, so that's a big deal. That's 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 a really big deal. We're hosing. May 4th, you know, that's what my sisters used to say when something came up and it was not something that you could grab and hold. They would say, oh, I hosey that. You hosey it. I don't know what that means. But I wind up saying that too. I, it's sort of like uh, if you're going through the TV listings in the paper, like they don't have that anymore, but that's how it used to be if you wanted to know what was going to be on. <clears throat> and somebody wanted to watch something. And it was something nobody else wanted to watch, but they wanted to watch it. They would call it. I hosey that. And it was like, oh, okay, she hoseyed it. So that's it. There's nothing we can do. Or if there was a dispute and you went to mom, um, mom, you know, she would say, well, she, I hoseyed that. Okay. That would stand. So it's legit. Well, um, we want to talk tonight, or I want to talk tonight about the scorecard. How do you keep your scorecard? You're you're in a homesteading operation, and full disclosure, there was some conversation about this this weekend with some friends uh, who, at one point, were kind of at a crossroads. Like, are we going to continue to do our homestead and work together as a family, mom, dad, the kids? And I believe I don't know this, but I believe. When they look at what goes on here, it is a family affair. My kids that are home right now, I got one daughter that's got one foot out the door. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I'd like to keep her here till she's uh, like 25. But I don't know if I'm going to be able to facilitate that. I may be able to. I don't know. Um, but we definitely work as a family. And let me give you an example. This is going to go to people who don't know what goes on here. We got Jay Z's with us. Rankin Resourceful. That's new. That's new. I mean, we may know you by another name. We got Dave Duncan's with us. Let me see. Got my trusty mouse with me today. Okay, and I I I, I like your input on, on here. So free to input as we go. Um You've started up a small homesteading operation. Maybe you waded into it accidentally, and then you found other people that, wow, they're way ahead. And they're actually providing a lot of the food for their home. And, wow, they're, you know, they're doing all these cool things. Or we go to their house and we see what they're doing and, you know, the, the involvement of their children and, uh, you know, there's there's something there that people like. So these people that we were having this conversation with this weekend, I believe that they see something here that they like. I, I do believe that. And then I've never they've never enunciated that per se, but um, I do believe that that's the case. And they get to a point where they're like, is there any way we can do this that we can have, you know, mom and dad at home, and then the kids work together and able to make a living. Um, I don't think it's a far stretch for the average person that listens to this to say, well, you could eke by. You, you could 
you could eat, you could be, you could make it. Um, but is that the creation that we live in? Is that it? Or is that a lie from the pit of hell? From another human being that's trying. Like, why, why would they lie? Why would they lie? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> why would they lie? Um, in just about every argument, because I'm, I'm raising an argument here. And my argument is, yeah, you can make money in farming. You can make money in farming. Now, you wouldn't hesitate to look at some one of these big, big farms around here. And yeah, it's owned by a family. And apparently they're doing all right because I see dad driving a $100,000 pickup around. And, uh, you know, look at the house and boy, they're on vacations all the time. So apparently uh, they're doing okay. But what you don't see is the debt load, right? So uh, you want to look at your family finances, or at least I do, uh, soberly. You know, you can have a lot of cool stuff, but if you have to pay for that stuff over time and you're paying a lot of interest on it, are you gaining or is somebody else gaining? That's the question. And I don't, I don't think I have to argue that too much. I, I really don't. Why do companies that loan money so-called banks you know credit card companies they're not really banks but they they've been authorized by somebody to loan money that they don't have uh, why do they do that you know uh they do that because that's their business they collect interest off of you you um get a credit card and it's a reasonable interest rate this happened to me uh like 6%. That seems okay, you know, for the convenience of uh, using the, the credit card, I thought at the time, or maybe Jill did. And then there's this whole thing that when I was military and I had to travel, uh, I can't be like Fannie Willis and just keeping a lot of money all the time. Uh, I have to, I had to use a credit card because I had to have receipts to bring back to my employer of what I was doing, you know? <laughs> and they could see what I was spending it on, right? I had to have receipts. I needed a credit card. Uh, Terry gave us one. Um, but then I needed my own because they were okay with some of the things that I had to do. But some of then when you travel, there's things that you want to do. And they're not okay with that. Like if I wanted to go to a, a museum, no, that's not duty related. And so that's not okay. Or if I wanted to go to, I just, okay, you, I'm sure you get what I mean. But as far as my, if I was at a place where they didn't have a, a chow hall and I had to buy food off, then I could do that or hotels, things like that. If I was getting trained or something. Um, so I had a credit card. Um, when we got here, it seemed like, well, everybody else does. So that makes sense. And uh, that credit card, Apparently, we were late on a pin, although it didn't seem like that. And all of a sudden, it went from 6% to 21%. And then I had two credit cards, or three at the time, and so did they. And so now all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute. This isn't fair. This is a long time ago. And I had to learn some lessons there, like this is not a good idea. This is just not a good idea. It's better off to wait until the money comes in. Um delay your gratification on the jobs that you want to do and wait until you can write a check for it and you have the money or pay cash. <clears throat> and doing business, that is the way to go. Uh, you don't want to get to a place where you have a lot of money that you are obligated to pay at interest because you're losing and somebody else is winning. Right. So you want to be very careful with that. And I, I'm sorry about bringing Fannie Willis's name up. It's just that it's been on my feed constantly. And I stumbled across it last week. And I think it was one of the funniest things that I ever watched. You know, I thought it was so funny. And then when they put her boyfriend on the stand, that even got better. And then they put her dad on the stand. That was even better. And now today, I find out that her boyfriend is texting with Letitia James out in New York. 
Fanny is furious. So the cat fight is to continue. This is going to be great, right? I think it's going to be one of the best years leading up to the election. It's going to just be awesome. Uh, so anyway, um, I think that when you enter into homesteading, and let's say that you uh, you start off on something like, let's just say, chickens. And you, you may have heard from the guy down at the feed store, well, there ain't no money in chickens. <laughs> you know, there's no money in it. But it's a, like a gateway into homesteading. Well, let's just analyze that. If you uh, live next door to one of these massive confinement operations where they are full of chickens and they're, they're, they're taking cases and cases of eggs out of there every day, and those eggs are going to Myers and Walmart and Aldi's, I have never gone in there and seen eggs for free. They're not for free. So those big confinement operations, they do it for a reason. They make money. They make money. Now, it's not the same process as the way we do it, by any means, not the same. And their product lacks in a place where our product excels, right? But as a homestead, I am not going to be supplying Myers with eggs. I keep about 75 to 150 chickens. And we sell our eggs at a price that is commensurate with profit, right? And we sell all of our eggs. And we make a profit on those eggs, right? Uh, I shared with you a couple weeks back, uh, alternative feeds. There's a lot of ways to do this to uh, cut your feed costs, which will increase your bottom line if you're getting four fifty or five dollars for a, a dozen of eggs. Um, you are making money and you are making pretty good money, right? Uh, enough money to make it worthwhile. Now, uh, I don't want you to believe that if you put a, a sign out on the road that says eggs, five bucks, that you're going to have people streaming it. Oh, five bucks. I got to get in there and get those eggs. No, that probably won't happen. Now, why is that? There's, there's surrounding uh, circumstances around that. Um, I'm whipping by, you know, Keith Sutton's house on my way to David Duncan's place to pick up a piece of equipment to come back. And I see a five bucks. No, I'm not going to stop to wing in there and get eggs for five bucks. I just, because it's going to interrupt my day. And most people are like that. Most people are like that. So Keith will have to, uh, market his eggs differently. And he does, he's worked an angle on it. He goes places during the week, goes to church on Sundays. There's, I don't know if this exactly happens, but I've seen this happen. I'm just using Keith Sutton's name because he, I know he won't mind me bothering his, using his name. And maybe he does this. I don't know. But he's going there anyway, and he brings some eggs and gives them to somebody. Oh, wow. That's convenient. Um, you got any more? Sure. Sure. Now, it may not be church. It may be, uh, I don't know. Um, we do jujitsu, martial arts. My kids do jujitsu. So we go on Tuesdays or Mondays and Thursdays. I don't go. I don't go. I'm here. Someone needs to be at the farm. I don't think it's good for everybody to not be here. I think there always needs to be someone here. Uh, but Jill takes the kids, and she also does jujitsu too. She's a killer. Um, and while she's there, she brings a cooler full of milk with her. And people that live in that town can meet her there two days, and she transfers, I don't know how many gallons of milk, 15 gallons of milk, 20 gallons of milk, whatever she takes. And it's convenient. It's convenient. Um, of course, another 
angle that we're hitting this at is we have people who live close, they come to the farm to get their milk. Milk is a, a hot commodity. Mothers want milk for their children, and it's a, a good thing. Um, there was a time when the science said that raw milk is dangerous. It'll kill you. And, uh, but that's been dispelled time and time again. And there are people who have children with health problems that need raw milk, um, grass fed raw milk. They need that. And it is a, it is a, a miracle substance. I drink milk all the time. I firmly believe um, that if I did nothing else, milking cows would some, be something that I would want to do because there's such a gain in it. There's such a gain in it. And my scorecard is, you know, it's got a, a graph. It's a graph, the bar graph, and one of it is dollars. And that is excellent when it comes to milk. For, the, for what I have on this property, I, I produce a lot of hay. And hay goes through cows really nicely. Cows like it. There's, there's no negotiation. They want all the hay they can get, and they will give me all the milk that I can take from them. Happily. It's a good give and take, real good give and take. They not only give me milk, they give me manure. And you you may look at manure as like a, a cast off, the, you know, disposal. We got to have somebody come in and haul that out of here. But no, uh, if you're producing hay, um, if you put a little time and effort into your manure management, you will have compost and then you get you a nice spreader. Uh, I can show you how to build one very easily and you get that spread out on your field and you're going to get more hay. You're going to be sustaining your operation. And I believe it was designed that way. I mean, it fits so well. It fits together so well. Um, the organisms that are in the field are real happy with the compost that we spread out there. And they say, let's get the, look, we like that guy so much. Let's produce more hay for him this year because he'll give us more manure. Okay. We got a good thing going. The cows, uh, I give them a lot of really nice grass. I even buy some nice grass, some nice hay for them. And I give them some other things too that they like. I, I went through this today in our, our video. Um, you know, grain is not a terrible thing. And when they get a pound of, gray, uh, of grain at milking time, it really entices them to be on my team. They, they really respond well to that grain. They love it. They're like, boy, I love this job. I love this job. Look at this guy. He takes care of us comes in, pets us, milks us, gives us nice bedding, all the hay we can eat, and a little bit of grain on top of it. Nice. They're loving me. So um, so my scorecard, as far as that goes, is I have people that come in here in my driveway. They come into the store. And those of you who have been here, you've seen the store is not anywhere near complete. But I, I have a vision of a really cute little place, you know. And they can come in. They feel at home. They sit down if you want. You can take your kids and go to the petting zoo and pet my, my emotional support goats. And, uh, and, you know, let your kids go on the rope swing and um, enjoy the farm. That is a column on my graph. That's a column. When I see people comfortable coming here um, and involving their families, and I'm looking at you, Zoka, um, that means something to me. You know, I feel like, okay, we've that's a good accomplishment. Those people feel comfortable here. They want to come here. Um, they feel safe here. Um, that's good. I like that. I really like that. Um, there was a, a woman that showed up, well, a girl, well, young lady, young woman, showed up here today, and I had I didn't recognize her. And she said, oh, I'm getting milk for, you know, and she told me, oh, okay, uh, are you her daughter? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, that, excellent. I'll show you where it is. 
So I brought her in and I said, do you, do you like this milk too? And she said, well, I don't actually use it because I get all this stuff, you know, this milk and cheese WIC program. I said, oh, okay. She said, but it's not very good. I said, yeah, that's kind of why some, a lot of mothers like you are responding to this so well is because they realize that. And when it comes to your kids, you want to give them the best stuff. And she's like, oh. And so we wound up in a conversation and come to find out she's perfectly happy living in the small town that she's in. But employment, there's no employment there. And I said, there's lots of employment. There's lots of things to do. And she really, and and she kind of said, well, I was thinking of going to college. And I said, well, then you, they narrow it down for you. And um, a lot of what you'll learn is only going to be useful in the jobs that they want to place you in. And a lot of those jobs are not, from what I hear, are not fulfilling and uh, they don't pay very much. And the college needs to be paid back for that education that you're getting or indoctrination which, that you're getting. So she was like, yeah, I know. And, and she said uh, something about the science and how she's disillusioned with what's been going on in the country and is kind of concerned that the wheels are going to fall off. And I said, oh, well, you know, uh, I have these conversations with people all the time and, uh, you know, there are answers and the answers are right within you. And she said, really? Like, what do you mean? And so the conversation went deeper and deeper and deeper. And when she left, she was kind of, you know, like there's, there's hope because she was struggling with tuition for the college. Like, where was that going to come from? And, uh, you know, so uh, that was a very important conversation with this person that who knows where they'll be in 10 years. And maybe she'll really make something of herself and she'll be able to mentor someone else, you know, to get away from the machine, you know, just the, the man, the whole machine is, is brutal. It's really brutal. And uh, at any moment, they can throw you into austerity. And then life is really tough, really tough. And we've seen this. We've seen this over and over and over. And the last thing that we saw was uh, people who were uh, threatened with being fired if they wouldn't allow a substance to be injected into their body. Like, that's pretty radical. That is pretty, ra that's pretty, I mean, you got, you got me over a barrel. I need to feed my kids. Yeah, but you can't work here unless you are willing to do this. And, and then this, and this, and this. So why do you want to get, why would you chase a career field like that? Where at any moment they could say, well, we require all of our employees to cut off their pinky on their left hand. Why would you do that? I wouldn't. And plus, it's not very lucrative on top of it. And you wind up in a job where there's no mobility. You're kind of a, a number and hey, whatever. I'm not. So there are there are other ways to do this. And I think that with the falling down of all of these institutions, they're just dropping daily. It looks bad. And of course, the other side is saying, this is going to hurt you guys, you know, all the public, you're going to be hurt by this. Well, I don't know about that. I think it's going to be tough for a little while, but we're going to swim out of it because we, we do. That's what we do. Um, so that's my scorecard right there. But for a lot of people, dollars are extremely important, extremely. Um, they are important to me. I don't want you to think that, well, I just you know, whatever. I'm just independently wealthy. No, we have our obligations to meet every month and we watch our pennies. Um, but it is a, a discipline that you have to begin from the beginning. You know, whatever you're doing, watch the numbers, watch them close. I would say watch the numbers as closely as you're watching all your little pet chickens and their names. At first, that's where people are. They get into it. Oh, I really like that one over there. Hey, you want to come over and we'll sit out in the chicken pen? We can watch my chickens. 
you know, when you've been doing this for a long time, it's like, well, that that thrill is kind of gone. You know, it's I, I understand it, but the thrill is gone. And you you move on to other things. You mature in this career field. And part of that maturation process is to, you know, lend a hand out behind you when somebody calls and say, hey, we'd like to come visit. Okay. Come visit. We'll visit and we'll answer the questions that you have. That's a match maturation pro process. And that I've stressed on this is you are not only learning these processes for your operation, you're learning them so you can pass them down, pass them down or pass them up. Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to make it seem like someone who gets in this is somehow lower. You know, they have less stripes. I don't, I don't really like that. Um, that's sort of a different, you know, the military process, when you first come in, you got no stripes on your sleeve and then you get one and then it goes from there up to you have, you can have a whole bunch of them, you know, and that shows how smart you are. Um, I, I don't really like that. Um, there is something else I wanted to tell you about. Um, you're going to have to look this up. Um, here in Michigan, we're going to be having a homestead conference this year. This is going to be the first year of it. I should know the, the dates. I don't. It's Mitten Homestead. Maybe I'll, I'll look it up here real quick. It shouldn't be that hard for me to find. Um, and it is a local um, homestead conference. And uh, I am going. Um, I don't really like to do those things. I mean, no, that's not a true statement. I do like to do those things for the the fellowship aspect of it. I like to be in with my own people, people who are into the things that I'm into. I really like that. You know, if I was, I, I sometimes go other places where it's some other thing, but I'm there. And it's sort of, okay, well, this is fun. But when it ends, uh, I'm going home to my thing. Um, when I go to a homestead conference, even if I go to another state, there are people there that I can relate to, I can talk with. And I have, you know, we are meant to be in fellowship with other folks. Mitten Homestead, I got it right here. The woman who's putting it on is... Her name is Mina Postman, and she called me and asked me if I would come to the conference and I would speak about something. And I said, yes, I will. It is in May. Oh, no, it better not be close to. It's May 17th and 18th. Whew. Mitten Homestead Conference, May 17th and 18th. And uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Me and Jill are going, and we're going to stay. We're going to camp out or something. Maybe I'll have my my schoolie by then. Probably not, but I'm going to figure some way that we can stay there. Maybe I can borrow a camper off of somebody. Or um, I've been thinking about building a camper, actually. Um, but we're going to stay there, and uh, I'm filling in for a guy who had an infection in his hip. I don't know him, but I think he's part of the tribe. Um, and he had a hip replacement and it got infected. So he won't be able to do his thing. And he was doing pastured poultry. So I'm going to fill in for him because um, I know everything there is to know about pastured poultry. And I'm also going to be doing the homestead hug. And we'll see how that goes. I'm I'm going to give it my all. all. I'm, I'm willing to give it everything that I have. I would even consider... Um, bringing some equipment with me and, and I, I don't have the facility. I have to check it out, but I, I would be willing to do some processing. I would, I would give it my all because I think they're going to have a good crowd of people there and we can pass on information. So that's kind of how I look at these homestead things is, um, Is there going to be a bunch of people there that I can pass information on to, you know, 
Now, there is a part of those conferences that I think you have to be, I have to be careful of. Like you go to a, a homestead conference and um, they lead to another conference. And maybe the, the grand pinnacle would be like the homesteaders conference of the world, you know. And I, I don't think that I am that interested in that. I had done a conference a couple years ago, many years ago. It was the Mother Earth News Conference, and it was huge. I mean, they had a a ski resort, and uh, <clears throat> it was fun, but it was a long drive to get there, and we didn't make any money on it. I actually, it cost me money to go. And I suppose I had the bragging rights of, well, I did, I went to Mother Earth News Conference. But when it was all said and done, we drove home and it was kind of like, you know what, you know, does that, did that lead to more uh, successful processes on my, on my farm? No, it, it really didn't. And so it, it's like some of those people that are into that, their career in homesteading kind of goes this way and well it's it's it it can part you know um i know people that have even spoken here that tell me well i had a homestead but i got so involved with public speaking that now i'm kind of a public speaker i do not want to do that i do not want to do that that is not my intention and so when I'll do a conference like the one in Michigan, it's local, it's going to have an impact, and <clears throat> I'm not leaving my farm for a really long period of time. Plus, uh, I'm at a place right now where my kids, if I'm willing to leave them home, they're like, yeah, see you, bye. <laughs> We're going to order pizza. Bye, Dad. <laughs> you won't be here? Oh, nice, nice. So oh, TV will have a good time. And and I totally trust them. You know, but uh, I can see where when I leave, there's uh, things get – they know what they have to do, but nobody's walking around, you know, terrorizing them about details, details, right? So – I will trade a lamb for five gallons of kimchi. You'll give me a lamb for five gallons of kimchi. I we don't make it like that, but maybe, maybe we could, maybe we could for a lamb. Huh. I don't know. You'll have to talk to the lamb guy and the kimchi gal. I'm, I don't do either. I don't do either of them. Okay, so all right, we got crunch with us right on. David Duncan, so you brought Blabby tonight. Um, so any of the processes that you start, I think that if, if you're looking to me for mentorship, I would say watch the money because the money is a, a sure indicator. When you do something, when you embark on a an operation, let's say, and, and I've, I've done these. I've done these. Uh, we uh, used to do anyone can farm on the road to where we would go places and we would do a class. We've kind of laid off on that because um, it just wasn't working out. It has worked out at a couple of places. Did it Crunchy's. Worked out really well. By the time we, we went to Crunchy Mama's out in Texas to do that, we knew what our numbers were. We knew what we had to get paid in order to make it work for us. And there was also a, <laughs> there was a uh, array of, well, I want to go see those guys anyway, you know? So we didn't have to really kill it in order to, hey, let's, let's go, let's go. Um, we did an operation one time out in Ohio. It was a great one. And we quoted them a price for it. And when everything was said and done, we lost money because we didn't take into consideration all of our expenses. But we were new at that, you know. Uh, so dollars is a really good way of figuring out if you are gaining, if you're making a gain. 
if you're if you say well i hear what you're saying but i'm i'm going to i'm going to sell eggs at a loss because i want to well okay go ahead and do that but you're not doing anybody any favors by that you're really not if you devalue the the if you devalue the value of the product that you're putting out and you you know give it away basically and give your labor away and your resources away okay you know but uh, you're not going to be called einstein by me i don't think that's smart to do that i don't think it's smart and if you were doing that with eggs and then you went on to processing or raising pigs and you make no profit on that well you're you're setting yourself up for um you know living under the bridge at some day because everything that you do you should make a gain and if everything that you do on your homestead you make a gain and then we pull all those gains together oh now we're making a living now we're making a living it's it's sort of like if you worked for a company and um they paid you x amount but you drove there in a Ferrari, right? You had to have a Ferrari. You just had to have a Ferrari. And then at lunchtime, you took everybody out for, for dinner, for lunch every day and got them the martinis and everything and all that stuff. And then after work, it's like, hey, let's go get some more drinks. And you come home and uh, at the end of your pay period, you get your paycheck and you bounce that against your credit card. It's like, whoa, I'm losing money to work here. Yeah, but it's fun working with all my friends. It's fun. I love, I just love working there. Well, in the meantime, you're going to get evicted out of your house and they're going to repossess your Ferrari and all that stuff. See, so you can do it outside of homesteading too. Um, the, the evil lie, though, that I wanted to spell is there ain't no money in farming. Right. You know, you say something enough and people don't manage their money properly when they get into a farming operation. And then they will say, yeah, but, you know, there ain't no money in farming. They'll say that. And it justifies why you don't have any money, why your farm operation is going to go tango. All, right. It's because you're mismanaging it. Um, this creation that we are managing in farming is a very abundant creation and there is enough gain in it for us to live comfortably it was made for us right <clears throat> but you have to do it properly i mean you have to manage it correctly and as you're going into this i'm going to share something with you here that uh you're probably going to want to write down copperhead they're not with us tonight they don't like it when I talk about milk and cows because I think they're afraid that everybody's going to do it and then it's going to pooch. But I, I don't think that's the case. We we did have an experience where we really like Great Pyrenees dogs and they opened up pastured poultry to us because we were doing pastured poultry, but we were getting murdered by predators, by predation. And to the point where I was, one day I was like, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. I mean, my morale was going down the tubes and, uh, you know, I, my fallback, my fallback, believe it or not, this is going to be a real um, shock to a lot of yous. My fallback was, I'm going to get a night scope for my gun. And I'm going to sit on that barn roof and I'm going to kill every stinking predator I see. And I'm just bear down. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to waste them all. And went as far as going to the store where you can buy that type of equipment and picking one out that would fit on my, my rifle and making plans to work nights. I'm going to be working nights. We call it lines, security lines. I was going to be pulling lines. The problem with that is you're you're falling into that whole killer mindset. You're just killing. And it never works. I mean, there are so many predators that live in these abundant woods. You know, 
all they're doing is responding to Mark's putting a free lunch out here for us. They're just responding to it and I'm going to kill them for it. That's, you know, that wasn't going to be good for me. That wasn't going to be good for my, especially that was not going to be good for my mental health at the time. Although it was like, I'm going to it. Um, and luckily, uh, I was at a small farms conference when we still had them here in Michigan that were run by just farmers. It was before the university took it over. And who was speaking? Uh, Daniel Salatin, Joel's son. Right? I had seen Joel the year before, got his book, read it. Then Daniel spoke the year after that. And afterwards, I went up and I said, I'm about ready to stop doing pasture poultry. I'm getting murdered. And uh, I had kind of put a pause on the night scope um, for various reasons. But uh, uh, he said, you need, a, you need a dog, is what he said. I remember him saying that, you need, you need a dog. I said, well, it doesn't say that in the book. And he says, yeah, I know, but you need a dog. And what kind of dog? And he's rattled off about five kinds of dogs, and uh, I got one. I found one right away, Great Pyrenees, got it. Uh, and she was a puppy just in time for pasture poultry season. And our predation whew, dropped off to nothing. So I wouldn't have known that. Uh, and I didn't know it before I started doing pasture poultry. It was only when I had a couple of feet in and I was getting beat up by those predators and my morale was going downhill fast on that. It's, it's bad when you come out and you find five dead birds just only eating, you know, certain parts of them. And, and there's nothing we can do with them at that point. So, uh, yeah, Pat, where was I going with that? Where was I going with that? Guide me, brother David. Guide me. Where was I going with that? So, um, yeah, we were taking tremendous losses on that. Tremendous losses. So our bottom line was not good. We had to find an answer to that problem. And we did. So it's not no on coming to lug maple sap buckets. <laughs> Yeah, they definitely do the work for me. The puppy sales got flooded. Oh, yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. So I really started talking up Great Pyrenees. Hey, look what's happening here. And uh, w after a while, um, my buddy Devin got into it. He got a puppy from me, and he's breeding them. So he's up there in Williamsburg breeding them. And uh, somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to see people calling me. Hey, you want to buy a puppy? And and like we still had two, two uh, females at the time and it was going really good for us. But then it started to like, oh, we couldn't sell them so quick. And so we got out of it. But that's not the same. Puppies are not the same as milk. It's not the same. And I, I probably should have had this talk with Copperhead about milk. Milk is consumable. So you may have somebody that moves into your neighborhood and they start milking cows Maybe they're Amish, and their their motto is "We can do it cheaper." So they'll sell them. You're selling milk for ten dollars again. They'll say, "We can sell it for nine fifty, and they'll do it. And you will lose some customers. And when those customers walk away, you never let them come back. If they're gonna ditch you for fifty cents, don't let them come back. You know, I don't want them back. You know, and there's more customers out there. I live, my my town that we sell in has 10,000 people. Cadillac, the thriving metropolis of Cadillac, 10,000 people. There's probably 9,500, 9,500 people there that don't know my name, never mind that we sell milk. You know, And if they all knew that we were selling milk, uh, we don't have enough milk. We need more people to be milking cows here, to be selling milk and Cadillac. So, um, yeah, in some areas, puppies are consumable. I think, yeah, Taiwan. I actually was stationed in the Republic of Korea, 
And uh, as a good GI who uh, partook in lots of adult beverages with my friends, I ate dog because you have to, you know, if you're going to be there and you have to prove your manliness is you got to eat some dogs. So I did, but it was preceded by about 10 adult beverages. Those were many moons ago. Now I'm just into tea. Yeah, I'd rather have raw milk and cheese. Honestly, I would nowadays. I don't really even, yeah, I don't um, want to disrupt my thinking process. So am I clear that you have to have a, a means to know whether you, you are winning or losing? And dollars are a good, they're a good medium. Uh, because we can we can check on the value of dollars very easily, and that's really all you have to do is drive by a gas station and see how your dollar is doing. It, it's not that gasoline is in short supply; it's that the the value of your dollar has gone down. And it's a really neat system that they have for them that they can inflate and deflate the the U.S. dollar, and that's done for a lot of reasons. That's the parasite class that doesn't really work, but they want to have nice houses and cars and stuff. So they do that. And, then, you know, I say just let them, you know, I, I think that if we get dollars and we want to protect those dollars, the homestead is a great place to do it. Let's say you come into, oh, this just happened with us. Um, I'll be real transparent with this. I, I don't think there's a problem with being transparent with this. Um, I have a butcher shop that I built. Um, it's the second one that I built. And I, now that I'm thinking about it, Sean Kelly actually donated money to my killing floor. I didn't really know that. I was That was brought to my attention by my lovely wife. And she said, I got to tell you about this. But um, And so I've, I built this uh, new butcher shop. So I have the ability to take a large animal and break it down into the pieces that people can use and they can, they can buy. And um, so a friend of mine had three sows that she no longer wanted and had put them up for sale as sows, you know, functional sows, mangalitsa sows, big ones, big girls. They were 350 pounds, not huge, but they were a good size and nobody wanted them. And she said, I'll sell them to you cheap. And I said, how cheap? <laughs> and so she shot me a good deal. I mean, a really good deal. Um, and I couldn't refuse it. 200 bucks a piece. I went and got them, brought them home. We, I turned my crew loose on them, Jim and Frank. And they knocked them down, um, got them cleaned up, and gutted and everything. And then we moved them into the shop. They sat there for a day. And then my crew, you know, me, Jill, Rachel, Jim and Frank at different times threw down on them, took them apart, processed them up, got them all packaged up. And, you know, we'll be selling them for three times what I paid for them. But we put that work into it, you know, and I'm not opposed to working. I like working. I teach my children how to work. My wife likes to work. Um, and the fruit of that labor, of that expertise being able to do that, is dollars. We got those dollars, and it just so happens we needed something for the house. We needed, we actually, we needed some firewood. So it was really easy to just say, yeah, bring us a load of wood. Now I could be out there cutting it, but I don't. I'm working in the butcher shop, and and you know we're done with that project. And uh, I could be cutting wood now, but I'm actually putting a floor in the store because the store is a medium where you sell that stuff. People come in and they open the freezer and oh wow, look at that mangalitsa chop! I got to have that. And they take what they want. And then they give you dollars for that. So it's a really good setup. 
Um, I can buy cattle from people who need to move a cow along for some reason. And uh, I can butcher that cow and turn into Hamburg and Hamburg sells really good. Just so, but if the guy selling the cow says, yeah, but I got to have, you know, $8,000 for it. I, I know my numbers and I say, well, that is not going to work. Thanks anyway. It's not going to work. Oh, well, I thought you could sell it. I could, but not, not, and pay back that. I, I can't sell it for that much. I know my numbers. If we sell hamburger at seven fifty a pound, you know the payback will be we'll pay the cow back if it's reasonable, and then have half again half again as much, and that really pays the labor to do it, and the and the facility. You know it pays for that electricity, all that stuff, and and there is a gain. There's a gain above. Of over and above, and and it's fair. It's a fair gain, and I'm all about a fair gain. Same thing with milk. There's a fair gain on that, and it's it's not something that I would recommend people do if you're just doing it for fun. If you're not going to make a gain on it, so you know I do a fair amount of recommending or consulting, and. That is one of the things that has done really good on this farm for a lot of different reasons, but there is financial gain in milk and there is also, <clears throat> it's a, uh, like a, a leading product. When, when a mother comes here and she says, I want, raw, I will pay you $10 for the raw milk. I come and get it. And you know, you can tell she's very grateful for it. Oh, while I'm here, I'm going to get some eggs. $25? Yeah. Oh, I'll get the eggs. See, so she's in the door. It's not like coming up the driveway just to get uh, a dozen eggs. Let's well, let's drive all the way from Cadillac all the way out to Marion. Eggs. Oh, that's 20 miles. You're going to just go. Well, no, but they will make that trip for milk there's no other place to go to get, get milk except maybe there's an amish community up in in manton which is the other way but um you know they're hit and miss you can't call them on the phone and they don't have a system they don't have a system they milk in like two three cows put it in the fridge and the freshness thing kind of stems so they don't write the date on it and and then the whole I don't want to throw stones at the Amish. Don't need to. But they can do it cheaper. And and that's not always a good thing. You know, uh, if if you're oh if you're gonna undercut people, then we saw this when we were going to farmers market. There were people that would come to the farmers market. It was supposed to be that you, it was all your own produce, and they were old people. And we just didn't think that they were collecting up all that produce out of their own facility. And they were selling it so much cheaper than everybody else. But they'd been there a long time that other people really couldn't compete. And I looked at them and I thought, that's not really fair what you're doing. But they were heartless when it came to, to selling their produce. And the market master, she was friends with them. Years they've been friends. Well, of course they produce that stuff. So... It didn't work for us. We were out of there. I'm, I'm not a big farmer's market person because there's so much setup and tear down. And then if you're bringing stuff home, you're a loser. You're, you're, you've lost, you know, that's not a productive model for converting whatever you produce to dollars. It, it's not productive. Now it might be something that you have to do uh to start your customer base maybe but now we have we have social media that's pretty effective in starting your base and I, i'm not sure if i've mentioned this before but referrals is what you want you don't or i don't 
I don't want people coming in here that are not referred. I want people who a friend of theirs told us about us. You know, like somebody gets milk and they're with with a mom's group or something. And they mention, oh, yeah, I raw milk my kid. Where do you get it? Oh, we've got a farm over here. Because I tell my customers, don't refer us to losers. Don't. We've had some beauties come through. You do. When you're in a business like this, you have some beauties. And I've got some real stories to tell people that I don't want to do business with them, you know. Um, so puppies are consumable. I read that. People are getting triggered by politics this year. Beef classes are going to boom. Yeah, I'm getting triggered. <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting to know what Letitia's going to do, man. Letitia and Fanny, they're going to go at it if they find out that that uh, that Nathan's been texting. He, she, he's been texting. He's been texting Letitia. Fanny's going to go ballistic. It just keeps getting better and better. I cannot believe it. I just... I'm not sure if it's real, but it sure is fun to watch. It really is fun to watch. And all the commentary on it is just outstanding. It's just fun. But in the real world of homesteading, uh, I was talking to Joel this morning, and I said something. I thought, you know, that's pretty profound, actually. It comes out of your mouth, and you say, wow, did I say that? But we were... It, I shouldn't say we, it was me. Um, I listened to a podcast that just came up on my feed. And it was, the guy was a special forces army type ranger and he was a homesteader. So I thought, no, oh, I got to hear what this guy is saying. He was talking about security on the homestead. And he went into a whole bunch of things, you know, that, I, he didn't go deep enough into it because people need an explanation on what he's on the terms that he's using. But I, I thought it was pretty good. And then I thought, you know, I could help him because he said, well, I suck at homesteading. And I said, I could help him because he spoke well. And I guess he's well known. Um, and then it was uh, American Homesteaders is what it was podcast. Yeah, it was American Homestead, I think. Anyway, and, and I said, you know, I'd like to go on there and, and interview. And then I started looking at some of the ones that were under it. And there's all these homesteaders that got millions of views. Millions. And then I, I'm like, who are these guys? And you got a goat. You know, you're not. And I'm thinking... We put a lot of time into this, and uh, and then I I had to shake myself and say, wait a minute, what's your scorecard? Is it views, video views? I'd say goodbye to that a long time ago. I really had to, because they don't really amount to much, anyway. And are we content providers or are we farmers? We're farmers. That's what we are. We are um, production. Homesteaders is, I guess, would be the correct terminology. A lot of times production farms are not multifaceted. A lot of, a lot of production farms are monocrop. And I am not that. I'm not interested in that. And that is unnatural. And you wind up, I, I think you wind up in a bad position with that. You have a lot of cast offs that you can't turn back into the operation. So I'm not into that. Um, I would, I would be denying the abundance of this creation if I did that, really. I have a lot of faith in nature. Um, I'm not a big... I'm not into it when they overcomplicate, you know, composting, like with test kits and all that. I'm not into that. I think nature does a fine job on its own, does a perfect job. And all I have to do is my part. Be pretty straightforward. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not against learning new things. Don't get me wrong. But the whole CV-19 thing and the trust of science, that was a real flag to me. Plus, 
um, going back years when we had the pig discrepancy, the feral swine incident or the feral swine war, um, they had given a list of characteristics. And I've told you guys, the ninth characteristic was my favorite. And it read other characteristics not currently known to the scientific community. So they use science. Um, and it's it's not it's not the scientists that are doing this. It's the people who are pushing an agenda and they they cherry pick scientific commentary and they use it. And then they say, well, hey, it's the science. Because I had a knockdown drag out fight with some woman one time when I said, well, I don't. I don't really know if I believe in, uh, I, I, I knew I was doing a homestead hog harvest at a friend of mine who is a bona fide hippie and they have a lot of hippies come in and they don't like to pay. They don't like to pay full price, but they'll, they'll trade you doobies and stuff. So I don't go there anymore. Cause I'm not, I'm, that was just for the birds. But I said to this, this woman, uh, I'll just leave it right there. I said, well, I don't really think that, uh, I think the jury's out on this uh, global warming thing. And she's corrected me. It is climate change and it is settled science. And she went on and on and on. And I finally, I couldn't help it. You know, I couldn't help it. But I said, so you're a scientist then? I mean, this is firsthand information that you know. She says, no, but a guy that I used to date is. Oh, Okay should have known you know so they will use that to push an agenda and like a lot of the people that are pushing the global warming thing or now it's climate change they have an agenda and that is the vehicle that they use and they seed in a little scientist in there and you're not allowed to question it unless you have a brain and then you say well i just don't believe it and i don't care and the business that i'm in Nobody can say, well, then your grass is not going to grow this year. If you don't believe in climate change, your grass is not going to grow. We're going to rescind that. We're going to put you on the bad boy list. No, you can't. You can't put me on the bad boy list. You can't. I'm just, I'm not involved in the machine. So there's nothing that you can hold from me, you know. And that's one of the, the tenets of homesteading is self-sufficiency. So you're not subject to these psychopaths that have been running these operations on the humans for a long time and they're losing control. That's what this whole thing is about. They are losing control. The psychopaths have inbred too much and they're too psycho. So we got Letitia and Fanny that are running the show. Can you imagine that? Standing before them as a, Fanny was a judge. She was a judge. Can you imagine a guy like me standing before her if I had done something? Whoa, slam dunk, buddy. You're gone. The Lone Star is with us. Welcome. Welcome, lad. You're going to have to watch this because I'm going over and I'm just looking at the time now. Well, I appreciate this show. I appreciate people showing up um, and fellowshipping with us. Um, Take heart. Uh, February is waning, and then March can be a really tough month around here, but I think we're going to have a nice time of it. Um, I'm expecting warm temperatures tomorrow, up in the 50s. Um, you know, global warming is bad this time of year, but we'll take it. What can happen when you have warm temperatures like this? And March is still out there because March can be bad. Um, what has happened here before is our trees will bud and then we'll get a hard freeze and it'll whack them. So uh, we're hoping that that doesn't happen, but it always, it can. Um, but the grass makes it, grass is a very durable crop. Um, I think that from the point of view of sustainability and prepping, um, I could see myself someday having a lot less pigs because uh, you never know. My bread contract might 
go away, but my grass will always grow. And so long as the cows eat the grass, I'm pretty sure that they're going to manure. As long as they manure, I can compost it and I can get it back out there and I'll have more grass. So I'm in a pretty sustainable deal. Um, and there's things that I can do along the way. I'm actually working on a system right now to where I can do some irrigating. And I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Huh. Brian Jacob is selling, saying it'll shut down the maple syrup real quick. I thought if you get warm days, just as long as it's cold at night, you'll get you'll get uh, sap going. I don't know. I'm not really into sap. I think it takes a lot of time. I'm not really into maple syrup that much. Um, my parents-in-law do it. And they do a lot of it. They do a lot. They're really into it. And so they share it with us. My kids go over and help. So I don't. All right. Is that it? Keeping your scorecard. Very important to know that you're gaining. Uh, I have processes here that I have dropped because they were, we, we wrung them out. We did them as hard as we could, but we were still, there wasn't that much gain in it. So we let it go. Oh, I was going to tell you, when we first started the farm up, I stumbled into this. <clears throat> um, I've told the story many times before, but for the new people, all 11 of you, I don't trust that view counter. I really don't. But uh, we were processing our own chickens. Um, <laughs> that's good, too. I'll comment on that in a minute. We were processing our own chickens, and uh, I had a guy told me about an Amish guy that had a chicken plucker and I'd never seen one, and I stopped. I just wanted to see it, and he told me, oh, yeah, it works good. Didn't have an electric motor on it, though. They ran it with some gasoline motor or a pedal bike or something. <laughs> so I bought it off of them, and I put an electric motor on it, and it worked pretty good. And so it was really changing the way we processed chickens as a family. The way we did it was we had a, a pipe over two sawhorses and then buckets that you sat on. And I would dunk the chickens and then I would tie them on there and the kids are sitting on buckets pulling feathers, having a good time. So um, with the plucker, it made it much easier. We were plucking chickens one evening and our veterinarian pulled in who we're real good friends with now. but uh she said oh you process chickens yeah doesn't i thought everybody did in a farm community oh no no the amish used to but they're not doing it this year she says oh okay she said would you be interested in doing the youth show chickens I don't know what the youth show is, ma'am. So she told me, and she said, it would be probably about 50 birds. I said, yeah, I guess we could do it. And I was thinking we were being asked to do it for a favor. You know, the vet asked you a favor. I guess you got to do it, um, was my thinking. So we said, yeah. And then, oh, well, how much do you charge? And I said, I don't know. I never charged anybody for it. And so I actually have a sign down in the shop. When we first started, we were charging... A dollar twenty-five a bird. Yep. So you do fifty birds. It would take you, you know, six hours, and you made fifty bucks. And we could split that up with, the, you know, the kids and stuff. So it was just. But then we realized we I'm not doing it for this. No, this is cutting into my life. You know, I was still working full time, and we were doing it in the evening, and so we boosted the price, and now we're at four fifty, and. I think Jill says we got to go to five this this year. We know our expenses after we get done compensating everybody for their. No one's going to work for free, and uh, by the time we get everybody compensated and us paid, um, that's what we got to get to do it. I know it's a lot, but I don't control inflation. I don't do that. So we stumbled into that and. The next year was 
the year that I had been approached about putting hog houses in, right? You can make $60,000 a year is what they said off to each house. Wow, I'll take two hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. I was, you know, on a, coming off a GI salary. I was like, I'm rich. Uh, but then we found out that deception reigns in the, the ag, the industrial ag community. It reigns. Deception is the name of the game. Ripping people off is a hobby that they, they live by. And um, so luckily I was kept out of that. I was all for it, you know, like, it'd be great. But I was kept out of it through a turn of events that I would relate some other time. And I'm glad I was because I would probably still have those hog houses here. I probably wouldn't be here because you really don't make any money off of them. You have to work off farm in the hopes that someday you'll have them paid for and that the people who are putting the hogs in there will continue to do business with you. You live off their contracts, but if you're not a good boy, no contracts for you and you still got to make your payment on them, that million dollar note, that's how they do it. And I come out of the service, just trusting everybody. You know, we did have to trust each other and thinking it's probably really trustworthy out here in the civilian world. Come to find out they do that so they can take your farm away from you. And that's how those guys get rich. That's just an, an income stream for them is, well, this guy defaulted on his loan and we got his farm. So we're going to sell it. And, then, you know, that, that probably would have been what happened. Um, so I'm glad that didn't work out that way, but the chicken processing thing has stayed with us. And the, the moral of the story is don't do what you want to do, do what you got to do. Right. And after a while, you'll start to like it. And after a while, you'll start to embrace it. And, and now this year, if, if, uh, if the intern program, if it works and people come, if I can get three other people to come and work with Covey, I will turn it over to them primarily. And then we can stipend them out of those dollars so that they can have a little bit of spending money while they're here. I'm not going to pay them while they're here, but they will make money doing that if we plug them into that operation. And then I'll be pulling my kids out of it to use them for construction projects. So those two things do go together. What I probably should do is charge their parents 10000 each for the, the information that I'm going to pass on to them and then I could pay a contractor to do con the construction projects. And then I could stay in the house and watch Oprah. That's probably what I should do. But I, I, I don't think I'll do that. All right. I got to go. Appreciate everybody coming by. It was a fun night. Good subject. Um, if you could do me a solid and you have grandchildren or children that would benefit from the intern program, or you'd like to help us with that program, um, I'm I'm the one that has to pay for the, the housing. I'm the one that has to pay for all the, um, I got to build a bathroom for them. And I got to put a, a turn off, a shut off on the water line going over there so I can punish them when they're not being good boys. But if you would like to help with that in any way or pass it on to your friends, that would really help me out. And uh, give us a thumbs up to help with the algorithms. All right. Remember, anyone can farm. Good night. Oh, we did not have our consulting call last Wednesday because of Valentine's Day. So we're going to do it tomorrow night. So we're going to be out of cycle, but... I think people need it, all right? So hey, if you are a Tribe Plus member, please tune in. What's the story with these Tribe Plus members? You're not going over and watching the videos that I put out every day. I'm only having like a few views on it. I'm going to continue to do it. That was the, the contract. But come on, this is good information. All right, got to go.